Good evening and welcome everybody. Welcome to another Friday Night Live of Hear Me Now Ministries, where we are dedicated in a generation of preachers. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're always thinking about that next generation, the ones behind us who are already uh, holding the mantle of the church, the ones behind them who are stepping up, stepping into those roles that are so important for the church, especially now in the last days. We want you to be better than we were. That's our motto. That's what we're here about. We want to help you be a blessing to you. Thanks for joining us. If you're here tonight and you want to say hi, drop it into the comments. Hey, Warren, happy Sabbath. Good to see you. If you're out of town, Sherry, if you're from out of town or from out of the country, I'll say hi and let us know where you're watching from. Edward, hello. These are some of our regulars here. Good to see you again tonight, Bobby Lee. Happy Sabbath. Wouldn't know what we wouldn't do when I was Tina. Wouldn't be able to do it without these folks here. No, let us here again. Hey, you know that. Good to see you tonight. To see you. There's Tina. I'm looking forward to it too. I'm, I'm going to talk about it in just a minute. It's going to be exciting. <coughs> Thanks for being here, Tina. Where are the other Boston people? I, <laughs> yeah, we know you're out west. <laughs> no, that's in California. The car, it's on its own country. Well, it, it tried to be. <laughs> I believe in Georgia. All right. Well, tonight. We are very, hey, Ralph, Ralph's in Boston, up at the AUC area. It's probably, I don't know if I told you, Ralph, I saw one of your sermons uh, about a month ago. I went on looking at AUC's um, video, some of their old sermons. I saw you preach a sermon there. I don't, I don't think I ever told you that, just a few weeks ago. And, uh, man, you're pretty good, man. I felt a little, <laughs> felt a little pressure. <laughs> hey, good preacher, Ralph. Been there a long time, too. I know you and your family. God bless you. Good to have you here. Well, tonight, we're excited. We have a special guest. We're going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh, someone who is one of the best known, at least in this country, best known Adventist ministers, who has had thousands come through his congregation over the years, the University Church where he pastors. Probably some of you watching right now will know him from the classroom or from his pew. He's gonna talk about his life in the ministry and the things that he has learned, the things he can share with us, especially younger ministers that are coming along. And uh, can have a chance to say hi to him when he comes up, feel free. And then toward the end, I wanna save a few minutes if you wanna ask some questions or make some statements to our guest. So a few minutes at the end so you can do that, talk to him directly. Uh, but right now, let's bring him on. Our special guest tonight, hey Mary. As we guest tonight is Pastor Dwight Nelson. Dwight, hello. How are you? Good evening, John. Happy Sabbath to you. Happy I'm doing Sabbath fine. To you. Great to, to be you. on. It's great to be on your podcast. It's a, it's an honor for me. Thank you. It's great to have you here, Dwight. And I've known each other for a lot of long years. I have. And uh, this exciting. <laughs> but John, let me tell you this. I was just thinking today. You know, for 25 years now, my life has been just tied tied to Nixon's. I want you to figure this out. John, John, you're the first Nixon I knew because you you were pastor at AUC. What years were you at AUC? Oh, man, I was at AUC uh, in the ni early 90s. Yeah, so we did the college pastor thing. Right. And then we we bring your kid brother, Tim, That's who right. joined us back in 1997. So I figured that, out it's been 25 that, years. That, Tim, right. Tim, and I, Tim and I are celebrating our 25th <laughs> anniversary as friends. Wow. And, you know, Tim, Tim is still in this community, pastoring That's here right. in uh, – the All Nations Church. That's right. Uh, and and then of course John Jr. was our worship leader at Pioneer. Oh, and I just met Paul. Yeah, he was. And now I'm meeting Paul tonight for the first time. Oh. And Michael, Michael, Tim's son, is VP for diversity here at Andrews University. That's right. That's so man, right. oh man, my life has been bound up with Nixon. Swarm with Nixon. <laughs> and I didn't even vote for him. And <laughs> neither did I. <laughs> but but here we are together. And yeah. Anyway, my you know, example, your friendship's been very important. And uh, there's Marion. Hey, Marion. Um, very important, a big impression on my life. <laughs> no, let once in a hard <laughs> question. You can ask any question you want. Listen, if your question is off base, Paul's not going to put it up on the screen anyway. So you know, we're, we're counting on Paul. <laughs> we're counting on Paul. But uh, ask whatever you want, uh, Pastor Dwight. For it. Now, I'm going to ask you, Dwight, you to start by introducing yourself. Some watching may not know you. Uh, uh, just uh, now, come on, Tina. Don't call us the Jacksons. 
uh, just introduce you. <laughs> that was a good one. I want to remember that one. The Jacksons of Adventism. <laughs> anyway, anyway, hey everybody, it, it's a it's a treat to be with you tonight. It's it's Sabbath where we all are probably right about now, but um, it's a great way to begin the Sabbath. And I'm Dwight Dwight Nelson. I uh, pastor here at the Pioneer Memorial Church at Andrews University. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this, but um, I, ca I came here in 1983. So that would be what, 10 wow. years I've been here? 1983, 10? Wow. A little more than 10. Is it more than 10? <laughs> a little 20, bit more. 20. Is it 20? Uh, a little more than 22. If my if my yeah. math. Is we're, right. we're coming up in <laughs> just a few days. Keep, we're coming, keep coming. We're coming. Keep coming. <laughs> Don't tell anybody this, but in a few days, we're coming to our 39th uh, anniversary of my first sermon here. And so, uh, it's, it, the time has just blown by. We started the 40th wow. year. And wow. uh, anyway, God's been good to us. This is a very loving congregation. They have been so patient <laughs> to tolerate us this long. But it's it's been a joy. And what we share tonight comes out of a, a, our common life of living, as I in my classes at the seminary call it, the bloodied up trenches of human survival. That's where we mm -hmm. live. I mean, the... The bullets are always flying over our heads. We're ducking down and we're running from person to person. We're in in the battle together, but it's it's a great place to be. And I'm humbled to to spend these moments with you tonight. Thanks. You you um <clears throat> excuse me. There's uh this Tim. My last half of the seminar was Dwight's first. Wow, first Sabbath at PMC when he was introduced. He's saying that when he went there as a student, as he yeah, was leaving, right. just coming on. Wow, that's yeah. I didn't know. That. May, May 1983. Wow. You know, that's unique in Adventism, as you know. Hmm. It's not so unique outside of our church. Many pastors have their own churches for their whole lives, but that's unique hmm. in Adventism, and especially at a church like Pioneer. We'll come hmm. back to that in a minute. But first, I want to ask you to talk about the story of how you came into the ministry. If you, okay. if you, if you can think back that far. <laughs> right. John, you and I are at the age where we... we the, the, the mists begin to form. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, uh, I grew up as a, as a, a PK. I'm a, a fifth generation Adventist, fourth generation preacher. Wow. Uh, and, but I grew up wanting to be a, a, a physician. I just, I just knew all my life I was going to be a physician, a, a neurosurgeon, something like that. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it really wasn't until my junior year in academy. And I'm going to this, I'm going to uh, Far Eastern Academy in Singapore. And we, some some GC uh, gentleman was coming through and they had him speak to all of us kids in the afternoon, Sabbath afternoon. And in the middle of his sermon, he he stops. He says, OK, I want to say all, all you boys, because back then it was only boys. I want to say all you boys that are going into the gospel ministry. I want you to just raise your hand. And, and uh, no, he said, stand. Hmm. So I knew I wasn't because I'm going to be uh, going into medicine. So I'm looking around thinking, man, these are all preacher's sons, doctor's sons, dentist's sons, teacher's sons. I mean, they're all missionaries and they're going to be they're going to be all over this place. And I was so stunned. I could not believe one here, one there, another one here. And I thought to myself, there should be more than that. And just like that, I heard a voice, not an audible voice, but I heard a voice inside my head. And just as clear as day, the voice said to me, why aren't you standing? Mm. And I, I, I didn't mm. stand. And it was some weeks or months. I, I, I'm not clear on the timeline now, but I realized that God was saying, hey, boy, you're going into the ministry because that's where I want you to be. And so that's how it happened. Um, went off to uh, Southern College, Southern Matrimonial College, where I met Karen. And, <laughs> and, and John, that's where you were teaching before you went into administration. Now, folks uh, who don't know, folks who don't know, it used to be it used to be SMC, Southern Missionary College, but all the students went there to find wives and husbands, so they started calling it Southern Matrimonial College. <laughs> so it worked for me, and I married a preacher's daughter. <laughs> yeah, so, you met your wife, so, you met Karen, yeah, really? And she's a preacher's daughter. Uh, okay. So anyway, long story short, but here's the deal: I want to say, particularly with, with young ministers, listen to now if there's some out. And Tim is on, but I wouldn't put Tim in the category of young. Would you, John? Would you put Tim in the category of young minister? Oh, he kind of passed that, passed that threshold. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, here's the here's the deal. I when I got in college, my uh, my sophomore year, I went through this whole. Am I should I really do this? And I had a struggle up in my dorm room in Taj Hall, and uh, you know the Lord broke through, 
But I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to admit something that I don't talk a lot about, and that is at periodic points in my ministry as a pastor, before coming to Pioneer and since coming to Pioneer, I've had some time, some some key moments, crucial moments where I thought, you know, I'm going to jump ship. I'm, I'm going into another another profession, another career. Mm-hmm. I only tell you that to, to let you know it's not going to be abnormal if you come to those times and you say, man, I, I should be doing something else. Why am I giving my life to doing this this mm-hmm. business? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and the devil will jump on you there because he said, man, here's my chance. I'll get that girl out. I'll get that boy out and, and he'll just be out of my way. Uh, if God has called you, like Eugene Peterson says in his book, Working the Angles, if God has called you and you've been ordained, you've been strapped to the mast, as as, as Peterson uh, put it, you've been strapped to the mast by your people. You can't get off this ship. It's in the middle of a storm. It may be going down, but you're strapped to that mast. And you and I, as pastors, we are on for life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not putting a guilt trip on anybody, but I am telling you, there will be times when you'll say, hmm, maybe I ought to be doing that. Or maybe I'd back, go back to school and do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're in this age of professionalization where everybody's got two or three you know, careers and degrees. You don't have to do that. You can come to the struggle and they say, nope, this one thing I do. And I got to honor that and you'll be fine. Anyway, that's that's my call. It's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, I think we all had that experience. I if we've been so. in the ministry long enough, we've thought about not being in the ministry. We kind exactly. of go through that. Yeah. So you've known since academy mm-hmm. that you were called to ministry. So you never went to medical school. You just went. No, no. <laughs> probably wouldn't have made it anyway. <laughs> Became a theology student. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have been pastoring one of the largest Adventist churches in the country the church where our seminary is located. So yeah. the majority of our ministers, at least in uh, North American division, will go to your school uh, mm-hmm. to do their MDiv, do their doctorate. You have an Andrews degree, so do I. We ourselves have started there. So um, what is it about, most pastors won't pastor a college church. Won't really? Really, just not enough colleges for it to happen. What well, is it, true. yeah, what about pastoring a college church that's different, that you've, that you've learned that you can share with uh, those yeah. who are coming by. Uh, let, let, let me uh, let me say one of the major differences. And you know, I never picked a college church. I had no idea that when we when we left uh, Michigan, Karen and I just blew kisses and said we're never coming back to the state again. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so here we are back for thirty nine <laughs> years. But but uh, so I never knew I was coming back. But one of the challenges that college churches face that no other congregation really faces in the same way is the uh, the uh, the 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 demographic slice that keeps coming Mm -hmm. through church. Mm -hmm. I mean, guys, you know, I'm a boomer. So I I, I, I come with a knowledge of boomer. And then in 94, they announced we got we got we got the Gen Xers here. So mm-hmm. I took a sabbatical to study Gen Xers and we made it, we began to get, develop the style for Gen Xers. And then 10 years go by and then they're the millennials mm-hmm. and the millennials were a whole new, they were a whole new business. Uh, and then just two summers ago, the words out, the Gen Zers are the first entering freshman class now coming in. And mm-hmm. so we've got Gen Z now and it's all, you know, you talk to the chaplains, uh, you talk to your own sons. It's just uh, it's 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 another generation. So that's been the biggest challenge is to try to this, this this psychosocial mindset that comes in. And now we got social media and everything's ramped up. I mean, everything is just ramped up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's been that's been the most exciting and most challenging part of, of working at university parish is the changing of the guard, just the changing of the guard every every decade or eight years or whatever it is, just this turnover of mindset. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, to add to that on Mm. your campus there, the elementary school is there. The academy is there. So you've got, you can go K to college right there at Andrews. So not only is that a generational thing going on, but you have people that are growing up right there before you're on. Yeah. Yeah. And then of course, these colleges also attract retirees. They all do. So you have a big retirement community. We got them, we got them all. <laughs> oh, man. Yep. It's, How many it's services do you have now? Yeah. Go ahead. How many services do you have now? We have two services now. Yeah. 
And, you know, the, you know, we're probably not going to talk about the pandemic, but the pandemic has hit the church in Adventism, the church in evangelicalism, the church in Christianity in America and, the, and North America in a way we've never been hit before. And it has changed. It is the rule books have been thrown out. Mm -hmm. We're all sitting around now as pastors asking, will they ever all come back? That's mm -hmm. the big question. Will they ever all come back? How many now have found a new way to worship in that easy chair with your pajamas on and a hot drink in your hand and you're just sitting there and you got your laptop and that has become worship for you. Yeah. And tragically, <clears throat> and boy, I preached a hard sermon on this April too because I'm doing a series, just finished a series called Sign Me Up. We, we, we have to fill 600 volunteer positions, and that's a challenge. And when people now are hesitant about, well, I'm not going to commit myself yet, man, we're, we're, it's, a, it, it, it's just a big deal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Hebrews 10, uh, 24 and 25, let us forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And the covenant language that, that Paul uses intentionally there says, you don't get the blessing if you're not in the community. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so strong. And I preached it. You don't get the blessing. You can't. This laptop, this is nothing. This is just information passage. There's no community. I'm touching the screen. I don't feel you and you don't feel me. There's mm -hmm. no contact. And this, the church will die if it tries to live, unless we're forced to live, okay? We go underground and we, we're forced to live on, on a screen. I understand that. But when we have the opportunity for a community, man, pastors, I feel your pain because it's my pain. We have to just keep calling for people. Come on back. You know, some people are hiding behind their masks. They're just sitting, using that as an excuse now. There's no contamination out. Well, there is to some. All right, I get it. But uh, we, we can't hide around, hide behind the pandemic forever. If God gives us a clear sky, clear skies, then the, the all clear is going to sound, and our saints need to come back, and we got to we just got to keep going. Now you said something fascinating just now along the way. You said six hundred volunteer positions. Yeah, how does that work? Yeah, well, that's that's a good question. How does it work? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we try. We changed the name of nominating committee to volunteer engagement committee because nominating committee didn't make any sense. What is a nominating committee? Good so, uh, yeah. So this is volunteer engagement. I got the chairman of the history uh, history department who chairs our VEC, our as we call it, the volunteer engagement committee. And man, they're trying hard. So I, this whole this whole series, you know, April, all the Sabbaths of April, and the last Sabbath of March, just boom, boom, mm -hmm. sign me up, volunteerism. This, this, the, the, the church was acts, the, the, the power of the risen Christ, preach this on Easter Sabbath, the power of the risen Christ ignites volunteerism. You have the mm -hmm. risen Christ in Acts 2, and the next thing they're volunteering. You have the risen Christ in Acts 4, and the next thing they're volunteering. So, you know, try, we just have to call the church back. And you're doing it very biblically, I see. Trying to. <clears throat> um, we try to emphasize preaching here on this podcast, sermon preparation, uh, sermon true. preaching. You preach every week. You preach to a diverse congregation. You preach. You preach twice on Sabbath. I don't know what you do on Wednesday. I know you also have the television broadcast. You can talk about that for a minute. How do you find material? How do you prepare your sermons? Kind of school us on that for for the younger ones. All right. Uh, well, the, the the challenge for us, all of us who have to preach week after week after week, it's like the uh, the, uh, the the preacher that walks out of the pulpit and what after preaching his heart out or her heart out. And the very first question you're thinking as you walk out of that pulpit is, but what am I going to do next week? <laughs> I mean, it, it, that, that's it. What am I going to do next week? Now, praise God, this was, God bless this, but what's going to happen next week? And we mm -hmm. live with that incessant, um, that incessant adrenaline drive and Holy Spirit drive. I've got to keep studying. So there's a verse over in Isaiah 58. What is it? Isaiah 58, 13? No, not 13. Isaiah 58, uh, oh, about eight or nine. You shall be like a well-watered garden, mm. a spring whose waters never fail. And uh, so for me, this freshness is a, is a Holy Spirit mission. It comes to your prayer life. And I want to say, you asked me, John, and just say three, three, three bits of counsel I give to young preachers, and we can do that towards the end. So I don't want to repeat myself, but but the, the, the prayer life of the preacher is absolutely critical. We all know that. I mean, that's, I'm preaching to the choir now. The prayer life. But the reading life mm. is also just, it, not just, but is, it is also critical. Mm. 
Because mm-hmm. if you're not reading fresh stuff, if your stuff, new thoughts are being inculcated into your thinking process, embedded in that little three and a half pound organ between our ears. If that, if that new material is not there, there's nothing to draw from. And so then you're that well is just getting drier and drier because I'm working on a diminishing commodity called back thought. Yeah. So re- reading is huge. And John, you know that you're, you're, you're a great reader and, and then you've got seasoned preachers on here who are, who are big readers as well. So, so reading is just a key. Once I set up a little series and I preach in series, I, I, I hardly do a standalone sermon anymore just because I, I feel like I need to keep building something and people, people will come back to something that's still being constructed. If you're just doing one, one night stands or one morning stands, I say, well, I, I miss one and I won't miss anything. It's not a part of something. Right. So series tend to draw people back in. I just finished this series called Sign Me Up. The series before that, before spring break, was on uh, the, a, a banner unfurled. It's on the Sabbath. It's the most difficult, but the most rewarding series I've ever preached. It was on the Sabbath of all things. Because mm-hmm. we have and think we know the Sabbath, and it turns out we don't know it at all. Mm-hmm. And so it was a series to try to go behind. And and uh, anyway, so once I have the series in mind, it, my, my sermon preparation is really it's 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 a no-brainer and it's nothing new but i just start on monday i just start working on monday start getting notes and i get my my scratch pad out and i'm just writing notes and i'm looking up i'm looking at the text that you know meditating through the text i have an idea by then that what the text is so monday i'm doing that i'm pulling commentaries i'm thinking uh, you know tr- real life experience how does that what's the segue here um uh, a Tuesday, more of the same. Wednesday, I got a blog to write. I got the bulletin information I got to get in. Thursday is my sermon writing day. So nobody bugs me on Thursday. I just take voicemail. That's it. Text everything. My, my, my telephone is turned off uh, because I can't afford to be interrupted. A mm-hmm. lawyer who's preparing for his defense is not going to take a call from the office saying they can't find the, the keys to the, the uh, water cooler in the back hall. Do you have the keys? He doesn't, don't bother me. I don't want to know that stuff. Uh, a surgeon, once he's into his task, he's not going to stop and say, your wife's gone from the house. Hey, the kids need some help. You can't. Once you're in it, you're, you're, you're just not available. And Thursday's that day for me, uh, fellow preachers. It's just that day for me. Why? Because by Friday, I've got to have my PowerPoint. I sit down with my PowerPoint operator at 1230 uh, Friday noon. I'm, I'm, they're all students that I work with. He's a young engineer. I got a young phys- physicist now uh, finishing up a uh, junior physicist. And so he he's he's pouring over my manuscript. We go through my manuscript together. We say, OK, here, 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 here. He goes and produces the uh, PowerPoint. We get together first thing Sabbath morning before church, go through it, see what he's done. So anyway, that's what I do. That's my cycle. That's and it's just week after week after week. Yeah. yeah. That's very interesting. So you have an appointment with your, with your, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, your individual person, and go through. Yeah, so you you be a manuscript with them. Yeah, really. I. What was that last question? You share your manuscript with your PowerPoint. Do, yeah. yeah. So I run off two copies: one for the director and one the, one for him, and he marks the copies because he'll go back to his dorm room and then produce on all the places where we mark his Bible text quotations. That That's kind it. Of, the big idea that I want to accentuate, whatever, you work all that through. We have a graphics designer that designs the uh, the PowerPoint uh, slides so that they fit wow. with the bulletin cover and all that kind of stuff. That's probably- but uh, yeah, it just, it just, it just goes through the week. And then boy, Sunday, you take a, I take a day off on Sunday and Monday is just back. Here we go again. But so you're, spending, um, you're spending four or five days. On yeah, that, on I that have stuff. to. Yeah, I have to. There are probably guys that can do it shorter, but uh, you know, John Stott, and you remember, hey, John, you remember John Stott, John R. W. Stott, the great Anglican preacher. Uh, he, he, you know, he wrote that old classic, Between Two Worlds, and he made the point. He said, for an experienced preacher, it used to be, you remember this, John, you remember uh, one hour in the pulpit, one, no, one minute in the pulpit, one hour in study. You remember that? And he said, oh, man, the divines would spend 30 hours a week. That's craziness. <laughs> John Stott says, listen, it's not that at all. It's five It's five minutes. For every five minutes, an hour. For a seasoned preacher. So that would be, if you preach a 30-minute sermon, that would be six hours. There's no way I can do it in six. I'm, you know, I'm up to 10, 12, 13, whatever. Right. Yeah, it's just, it's just, but guys, it's the one thing you do. Ladies, 
It's the one thing you do that makes the impact on your parish. When people evaluate worship, 80% of their evaluation is, how did I like the sermon? Mm -hmm. It's not the music. They're not evaluating. When they evaluate worship in my congregation, worship, 80% of it is the preaching. They're evaluating mm-hmm. the preaching, so mm-hmm. it's not a it's a big deal to our to the to the mem the, the the congregants in our in our pews. It's a big deal to God, and it has to be a big deal to us. We can't just blow it by. We can't pull out you know microwaved stuff from the past, he, heat it up real quick yeah. to to reserve to a new generation. We just can't. There the the technology now, and I'm touching it right now. The technology here is too sophisticated. This social media has just these they're, they're living with this. They're living with this. Every right. 60 seconds the screen is changing. And I'm right. gonna go up there and just kind of drone on and on and on. I can't. Mm-hmm. It's just the world has changed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and it's gotten sophisticated. People know when you're yeah. prepared when you're not prepared. Oh, they do. You're right, John. Absolutely. Yeah while you're up there and you haven't really given any deep thought to it yeah. and uh, contemplation takes time you got to have some days to contemplate and yeah. put this in so yeah that's, that's a good example of uh great that's why i said you could last so long in one pulpit and still and still be effective uh in one church all those years that's quite a challenge you've done a great job with that it's yeah, interesting I saw, um paul i saw I saw Andy Nash and I saw Tina put comments up there while we were talking just now. I didn't have time to read and I wanted to read those. I think you may know. Oh, Andy's talking about what gifts are okay <laughs> with all generations. And here's Tina. I appreciate the discipline. I appreciate his discipline to focus on the sermon. People go to church to hear words from the Lord, and we can't take that lightly. That's just what you were just saying. Tina's mm-hmm. woman in our conference. <clears throat> Good, for you, Tina. Good for you. You're spot on. Exactly. Exactly. It's a very important thing. Um, I want to, I do want to get to your tips for young pastors. I asked you to think about that in advance. Mm-hmm. But you do that. I also want to talk about this thing of work-life balance. Now, mm-hmm. uh, COVID has thrown all of us off, uh, whatever our regular schedules used to be. Um, yeah. What are we doing for a living? COVID has just rearranged our whole world. But even with that, uh, in ministry and every other place, as a person, you have to find a balance between your work life and your family life, and your, your social life, your own self care, all those mm-hmm. issues. Mm-hmm. Worked on that over the years. How successful have you been with that? I haven't been as successful as I should be, but how yeah. about you? I should just call my wife to come in and I'll have her stand in front of this little camera and That's tell you right. how successful it actually was or was it. Uh, you know, I'm still working on that. This, this work life balance is a trick. And the reason it's a trick is because as pastors, as shepherds of the flock, so to speak, Mm -hmm. uh, man, it's 24 seven. It's hard to go off call. You have to go off call. You go crazy. You just burn up. It just dry up. And we all have known experiences where it might have come close to that for us. Or we, we, you may have experienced it, or we all have colleagues that have gone through it. I sure have. Yep. Yeah. And uh, it's nothing to be crowing about. Well, it hadn't happened to me. Well, let him who takes pride beware, beware, you know, lest we too fall. The, the, the balance is the trick. And I don't I don't know what, what the, the, all the secrets. I do know that I've been religious in taking Sunday off, period. No board meetings, no elders meetings, no committee meetings, no nothing. Mm-hmm. I need 24 hours to unadrenaline. Because, you know, preaching is an adrenaline uh, occupation. I mean, it's just like a lawyer, just like a surgeon. It's just that adrenaline just starts going. You may look cool as a cucumber, but uh, those adrenal glands on top of your kidneys are just pumping it in, pumping it in. Keep on, keep alert, stay on the edge. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and if we don't come off that, uh, you know, we're dead meat. It just eventually that, that the cortisone, it just, it's just, it's everywhere. And then that's what, that's what stress does to us. Uh, so, so Sundays, I, I've just been religious about that. And you can talk to my kids and talk to my family. Uh, during the week, it's been trickier for me. Yeah. And I'm old school. And, and, and John, uh, you and I are old school. Uh, so we were mentored by people 
who, who, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment, so I won't get into this, but, but I, I got to be out among people as well. And sometimes evening is the only time I can be with people right? to call a group together. So we have our church boards on Monday evenings, you know, evening is prime time. And, uh, when the kids were, were, were young, I'd be home for the supper hour, some time for worship, playing around, horse playing here on the rug. And the kids grew up in this house. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm, I'm no authority on the work, uh, work life balance. I just know that we have to keep working at it. It's just, mm -hmm. you never get to a place where you got it down. And, you know, with, with empty nest uh, syndrome, now we got three little granddaughters who are precious and, they live here in Kettering, about four hours and 17 minutes away from our drive. Got it down, yeah, I got it down. I mean, I got it down. Uh, so, you know, w when it's just the two of you in the house or you may be single, you have a little more control. Right. But the moment you say yes to Jesus and yes to uh, parish pastoring, mm -hmm. and there's nothing like it, guys. I, I, sometimes I find myself standing in, the, in my church window, my study at the church, and I'm watching people come to church between services, all right? So we have a first service and then Sabbath school. I'll be in my study sometimes just looking out the window. I say, oh, there's sister so-and-so. I wonder how she's doing. And, and and there goes, oh, there goes one of my colleagues as a faculty member here at the university. I haven't seen him in a while. I wonder what's going on with him. And I suddenly stopped and I, I, I looked up to heaven and said, God, I am hopelessly, I'm hopelessly a pastor. And you know what, guys? Don't ever apologize for being a pastor. Mm -hmm. That is, that is a spiritual gift. It's one of the four key gifts given to the church to keep the church floating. It's not a high st status gift. It's just a high responsibility gift. And some are wired to do that. And that's mm -hmm. why I've gone into administration. I just, you know, this is, this is what I know to do. And that's okay. Paul comes along in, was it, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. Uh, great line. And boy, this is for us as pastors to keep this line in mind. Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm wired. Dwight is wired this way. There's nobody else on the planet wired this way. That's why if you and I don't show up, God has a hole in his heart. He's saying, man, I wired that girl. I wired that boy for, for, for life. And now he's not showing up. And I have nobody to take his place because you are irreplaceable. You are that unique to God. You cannot be replaced. Mm -hmm. I am what I am. But then he says, I'm not one of those super apostles. <laughs> so I take a lot of comfort in that because we got super <laughs> apostles in the church, man. They are super and they are apostles. And man, I'm, that's, that's not me. And I don't answer to those super apostles. I love them, but I don't answer to them. I answer to God. Mm -hmm. But Paul says, I'm not one of those super apostles. I don't have to be. And by the way, you and I don't have to be super pastors. We don't have to be super preachers. We don't have to be super anything. I am what I am means that there's nobody like you. So right. keep being who you are. Be true to what God has shaped you to be. You'll be fine. In fact, the less you try to be like you, the, 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 the colleague down the road, the better off you'll be. There's no point. You can't be like her. You can't be like him because you're wired to be you. And if you don't show up, God says, man, I'm missing. I'm missing somebody. That's a good point. Um, so anyway, uh, that's a great way to remember our calling. The other yeah. part of what you said, Dwight, is I am what I am. It also means that God wants us to be authentic, to be our truth. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Be real. Be real. He wants you to know, use it. I got a great little story for you. Uh, some rabbi uh, was, I read this somewhere, and a rabbi was writing. And a rabbi said, maybe his name was Ben Ezra or something like that. Rabbi Ben Ezra wrote, he said, when I get to heaven, listen to this. When I get to heaven, God is not going to ask me, why weren't you more like Moses? <laughs> He's going to ask me, why weren't you more like Ben Ezra? Mm -hmm. I made a Ben Ezra on this planet and mm -hmm. you were trying to be Moses. I didn't mm -hmm. need another Moses. Mm -hmm. That story is just stuck in my brain. Do I mm -hmm. just be you? Just be you. You'll be a lot more relaxed in front of people. That's You're not true. trying to be somebody else. That's true. Yeah. 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 It's a good way to think of it. I hadn't thought of it the way mm -hmm. myself, but um, yeah, God doesn't need a second Moses. Moses did his job. He and did. Moses, it. Do your job either. You know, Moses has got yours to to fulfill. That's a good way to think of it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, let me talk about this for just a second. Then I want to get you. I'm looking at the clock tips, and then I want to leave some time at the end for comments. Okay. Um, 
you read this same article, Christianity Today. Right. In fact, the latest issue was talking about what they call the great resignation of pastors mm -hmm. in the ministry. Mm -hmm. And how the number of pastors employed dropped from 2019 to 20, from 20 to 21. Again, they're expecting another drop in 22. Yeah. Students in the MDiv programs has gone down in number. And they asked this question, Dwight. They asked this question of pastors. Yeah. Have you given serious consideration to quitting full-time ministry this year? And in mm -hmm. January, in January, 29% yes. In October, 38% yes. This year, well, not, not 21. Yeah. Yeah, so right. just a few months, that number went up so high. Uh, and of course, those were COVID-19 months. That was last year. Um Pastors talking about quitting full-time ministry. Now, you mentioned earlier that if you're in the ministry for a while, you're going to have those thoughts yourself at some point. About you will. Um, but the pastor's actually doing it. I don't know if the if it's the same in our church as other churches, but what's your response? Have you seen this where you are? And uh, how do you yeah. feel about this, this idea? That's, that's, that's a good question, John. I, you know, I, don't, I can't respond to those numbers. I, there's no way for me to verify them. Uh, I don't even know what the numbers are in the Adventist church. I did have one of my pastors just this week, Ben Martin, who's our, our pastor for children's discipleship. Uh, point I said, Dwight, man, there's there's so many openings in the church right now. Well, that was new to me. Uh, and I'm the last guy to find out stuff about the church. I'm just sitting in this little parish. I don't hear stuff. But he said, yeah, he says they're just they're, they're trying to find pastors everywhere. So it could be because guys are just post pandemic saying, OK. We mm -hmm. waded through. And, and John, you and I were talking about this before uh, we got we went on air live uh, together but the the boomers now are the are the uh, egg and the python we're just slowly moving through and when this generation's gone they're going to be suddenly you know tens of openings every month because boomers are all retiring at the same time or in that stretch of 10 years or whatever mm -hmm. so the church does face a challenge i know the uh, uh your friend of mine ivan williams at the nad uh, ministerial that's something they're wrestling with how are we going to be prepared for this this gap that the mm -hmm. boomers will create when they're mm -hmm. gone. And because we're not, a as you as you know, because you are in the co uh, college level uh, teaching, religion department, there are not enough guys coming in and girls coming in to replace. So mm -hmm. then what? You know what's right. going to be? It's going to be two churches for you, buddy, and three for you, sister. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. It's going to be, it's just doubling up, doubling up. Why? Because we don't have enough, we don't have enough uh, pastors to fill the, the vacancies. And so, it could be a deal. The, the the very end of that article, however, as you recall, John says, "Well, we're not sure it's going to be as serious as we first thought." Right. It was interesting. They make this big point, and then they come to the end and say, "Well, maybe." maybe so <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they did that, but uh, who knows for sure? At the numbers at the seminary are down a little, I, mm. uh, but I, I don't know that it's a, it's a significant drop. Tim might know better than than I would. Yeah. For those who don't know, the Seventh-day Adventist Seminary, where most of our pastors get their graduate training, is on the campus of Andrews University. And you mentioned Dwight T.J. I'm sure you've taught there um, yeah. before. Um, so many, many of our pastors come through there. And so uh, that is a re some to some degree a reflection of Adventist ministry, what the numbers are like, because the seminary is kind of, sort of like a drawing spot there. Mm -hmm. So Nola says, start ordaining women without question or pause, and you'll fill the vacancies. <laughs> well, that's the that's the truth, and it, you know it's possible that necessity is the mother of invention, that's true. and that the necessity is going to drive the church to say, wait a minute, let's uh, get some sense here. Yeah. Let's not say that ministry is for only half of the congregation. Let's say that all could be called to specific pastoral ministry, and let's open the doors. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course. Many of us would just say, you know, that's that's a hand of God making that provision. Mm -hmm. And of course, you also know that other countries are seeing this, where the women are taking over the pulpits, the men just aren't oh, there. Like and China, church, like China, women are just leading churches, and so yeah. um, that may be coming our way as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Point. So, Dwight, take some take some time now, a few minutes. <laughs> My son John is there now. Mother Day women. Um, take a few minutes and talk to us about um, things that you would share with the young pastors coming up now from your experience, from what, from your reading, what are mm -hmm. some of the things that you wish you had known when you were yeah. just coming in your twenties, 
of uh, things that you've learned over the years. Um, okay. With that. We want to hear from you on that. I, I want to do that, John. And uh, this is just some stuff I scribbled down yesterday. So you could see it. it it's mm -hmm. not old stuff sitting around. This just in response to John saying, yo, Dwight, I wish you'd think about what, what two or three things would you say to young, young preachers? So if, let me let me look down at these notes every now and then because I don't have this this memorized. I have the burdens on my heart. Uh, uh, burden number one, and I want to take the words of Jesus in John fifteen five. You know John fifteen five. Abide in me, sure. and I in you. He that abides abides in me uh, shall bear much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Everybody knows John fifteen five. Mm -hmm. To me, uh, uh, fellow preachers and pastors, that that is the single most determinative factor marking spiritual leaders success in a parish is that abiding in Christ because you can't do it mechanically. You can't do it technologically. You can't, you can't buy a degree and get it. It, mm. it is. And, you, and the good news is you don't have to have a degree to get it. Right. You don't ever have to go to the seminary to get to have this. Jesus said, I just want you to abide in me. I want, I want us to become like this. Mm. Let's get to be this. Because if you will be in me and let me be in you, you're going to bear fruit. And that's the whole thing, guys. This whole business of ministry is about fruit bearing. Mm -hmm. And so number one is it's, it's, it's the passion of Paul. He says, I want to know Christ. That's Philippians 3.10. We all know that line. I want to know Christ. That's what drives. That's what must drive my ministry and your ministry. I mm -hmm. want to know Christ. Uh, I did a series last fall. First time I've done a full biography series of anybody, but the whole fall was was uh, Paul, uh, mm -hmm. a series on, on the life of Paul. And N.T. Wright, the great uh, British uh, uh, New Testament scholar, uh, has come out with a book. If you ever can get this book, and it's sitting out on bookshelves uh, in stores everywhere, uh, Paul, A Biography. That's the title of it. Paul, A Biography. Read that book. There are no footnotes. Well, there might be a few footnotes, but it's just written like a story. It's Paul's life and N.T. Wright. Who like N.T. Wright could deal with that? So mm -hmm. I did a series based on that. But Paul was a man who lived with this with, with this fiery passion. So, so number one, come on. Prayer life, our life of prayer is a, as, as I scribbled it here, it's an intentional, studied, disciplined, but free in Jesus calling. In other words, when Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Yo, you come to me, Dwight. Come to me and I'll give you rest. This is the baseline. This is the great baseline. You don't get graded for this. You don't get paid on this basis, but your people can tell it just like that. You can't fool. You can't fool your congregation. I can't fool my people. They can tell. Mm -hmm. And so a uh, uh, piece of advice from, from uh, an aging uh, young pastor, a <laughs> uh, piece of advice, number one, make, make your prayer life your priority. One thing that has kickstarted my prayer life, I'm going to tell you this, uh, was five years ago in, in this coming August. I went up to the uh, British Columbia, Hope Camp, Hope, Hope Camp meeting. They said, come on up, come, come on up here, Dwight, and, and uh, preach. I did. Friday morning, I had to preach to the pastor, so I went down to get breakfast, and a young man is walking in. We come into the cafeteria at the same time. I never met him, introduced myself, and he introduces himself, and I decided to sit with him. And he says to me, have you ever heard of Hermit ha uh, Helmut Halbio? I said, never heard of him. Who is he? Oh, he says, he's a writer. I said, never heard of him. What denomination is he? Adventist. I said, never heard of him. He mm -hmm. says, he's German. He was a businessman, and now he's he's written a book called Steps to Personal Revival. Oh, I said, hmm, interesting. You know, everybody's trying to tell you about a new book. I said, interesting. <laughs> and uh, the guy says, I'll be there at the workers' meeting, and I, I, I'll, I'll go up there. I said, I said, because I'm going to preach on the Holy Spirit. He gives me the book. Here's the deal. The book changed my life. I mm. read it on the plane going back. The book changed my life, my mm. ministry. It changed my preaching, changed my leading, changed, changed my thinking, and it's changed my praying. I never knew. John, I went to the seminary. I got my master of divinity. I didn't really master divinity, but I got the degree. I got the doctor of ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, but nobody once told me that 
The Bible is clear, New Testament especially, that we must daily ask for a bap- the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nobody told me that. Jesus told me, but I never saw it. Luke eleven thirteen. you know Luke eleven thirteen. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? I never knew that that, that uh, uh, word is in the continual. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him day after day after day? When Paul says, be filled with spirit, it's day after day. It's that same present tense, continuous action. It's not aorist. It's, it's, it, it's not punctiliary. It's, it's continuing day after day after day. And then I start reading. Ellen White says, Jesus was baptized by the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit daily. Mm-hmm. And it starts popping up and I'm realizing, and guys, this is, this is all you have to know. Get the book. You got to get helmet. How about here's how you can get it online right now for free for free right now. So you want to go to steps to personal revival. That's all you have to remember. Steps to personal revival, put a hyphen between steps to, you know, put a hyphen between those words, dot info, dot info, the book, you'll get it for free. You just download yeah, you download it. I have it on my device. You'll have it on your device. You can read the book, 120 pages or whatever. The book changed my life. I'm telling you. And I preached it. There'd be three sermons I preached actually on that website. You can mm-hmm. take all that stuff and preach it yourself. I'm telling you. It, it's not new with me. But the daily baptism of the Spirit. I'm going to go to the GC and they're giving me 12 minutes to talk about the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I walk, yeah, I'm, uh, but you, I can do anything in 12 minutes. So <laughs> that's the deal, guys. The prayer takes you 60 seconds, but when you mean it, when you understand, I can share this with you. And here comes point number two, but I need to share this. This is Desire of Ages, page 672. Uh, Claimed by faith, this promised blessing brings all other blessings in its train. This promised blessing brings all other blessings in its train. So if you want the one gift and another place uses the word gift, all other gifts. If you want the one gift that brings every other gift, the one blessing that brings every other blessing, come on, t- preacher, I'm telling you, you'll never preach the same. Yeah. Holy Spirit, today, baptize me with the Spirit of Jesus. Every day, pray mm-hmm. and mean it, and God will, ch- God will do something for you. But get the book. The book, will just, it'll just stir your heart. You'll love reading the book, and then you'll give it to all your elders. That's what you'll do. You'll give it to all your elders, and you get them praying daily for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean, come on. It, it, it'll be worth every effort to go online steps to personal info and get the book. It changed my life. So number one, I'll pop uh, the screen there, everybody pop okay, it around. Yeah. This is Dwight. Right. To yeah, us. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so uh, suggestion tips for young ministers. Number one, we, t- we took the Jesus abide in me and I in you. Number two, Jesus. Oh, here, here's a good verse guys. You, you haven't thought of this verse in a, in a hundred years. This is Matthew 10. This is Matthew 10, 12. Jesus speaking, red letters. As you enter the home, as you as you enter the home, give it your greeting. Mm. Mm. When's the last time you heard a sermon on that? I haven't even preached a sermon on it. But you know what? That line is big, and I'll tell you why. Because I got a bunch of young ministers on my pastoral team. They're all great guys and girls. I got two women and uh, two African Americans. And, and, and almost all of them are in the millennial range, millennial, just right in there. OK, mm-hmm. now I'm talking to you, millennials, because they're not. And maybe some Gen Xers. Yeah. No, Gen Xers are older. Uh, no Gen Zers. OK, here's the deal. Mm-hmm. Old school time. I want you to let don't don't turn to me out. Old school time. We need to embrace the model of Jesus in spiritual leadership. You say, Dwight, what was the model of Jesus in spiritual leadership? Here it is. MBWA, management by wandering around. Mm. That's how Jesus led. Jairus comes to him and says, My Lord, my daughter's dying. Come to my house. He said, Jesus said, I'm with you. Let's go. And he goes into the house. You remember, Jesus mm. was into the house. By the way, a Roman centurion comes and uh, Jesus says, I'm going to your house. I'll go to your servant right now. Come on, take me to your house. Oh, no, no, no. You don't have to go. You remember that story? Mm. That's one home you're going to. Matthew, Matthew, come, follow me, boy. I'll make you fishers and men. So Matthew goes and follows. And Matthew says, Lord, I got to bring all my conniving, cheating, taxpayer, tax collector, rather tax collector friends together. And for a banquet, Jesus says, I'll be there. Now watch this. Zacchaeus, tax collector. What did Jesus do with Zacchaeus? Come. He invited yeah. himself home. Himself. Guys, guys, listen, listen, listen. We're the only profession left on the face of this earth that has 
the right to walk up to a door. We're the only profession that people will answer the door and they say, oh, pastor, yeah, come on in. If a lawyer comes to my door, you think I'm inviting him in? If a, if a, if a doctor comes to my door, a doctor comes to the church, hey, doc, what are you doing here? But if you show up as pastor, as you show up as pastor, it's the last profession left. Yeah, yo, preacher, come on in. What can we do for you? Yeah, mm-hmm. I tell you what, you have you have license to step into that home. Now I'm I'm assuming everybody's home. And if the woman answers the door and there's nobody else at home, guys, you know the you know the rules, you know the game. Uh, right. I'll come again. When's your husband gonna be home? Because that's right. when I'll be. Yeah, right. you're never going to never, never, never. You understand it. But management by wandering around, that's what Jesus did. Because face to face, now listen, here's the deal. Here's my pitch. Face to face always trumps electronic contact. Of course. Now, I, I know some young preachers. I say, hey, go visit somebody. They'll t- send them a text. Now, listen, a text is okay. The text can say, I'm thinking of you. Okay? But the text cannot say, I feel your pain. Mm-hmm. Because you don't feel the pain. Mm-hmm. You don't have no clue to the pain. You just said, be healed. Mm-hmm. Call me if you need me. We got a generation now and the pandemic has only made it easier because now, oh man, I can't go over there. There's disease behind that door and I don't know what it is. Ah, rubbish. If you're doing the, if you're doing the mission of Christ, uh, uh, I'm not uh, subscribing to this. We have to live in perpetual fear now because the pandemic came once upon a time. Face-to-face contact is where life change takes place. Mm-hmm. I'm just making a pitch to a generation that says, no, we're going to do it on social media. Yeah, you know what you do on social media? Here's what you do on social media. You establish a lot of contacts, but there's no depth. You can't, your members may think, oh, I know the pastor because I follow him on Facebook. They don't know you. And, you and guess know. what? You don't know them. You don't know them. Come on. What is the meaning of the word pastor? Jesus said in John, what is it? John, John 10, 14. I am the good pastor. That's what Jesus said in the Greek. I am the good pastor. So uh, guys, give it a try. Be willing to step out. Just try it. Our people are longing for somebody to step into their lives. The whole electronic world we live in now is so naked of warmth and human human expression. What would happen if it's, this, my sheep hear my voice because they know me and I know them? Mm-hmm. You say, "Do I?" There's no way I can. There's no way I can reach my whole congregation. You're absolutely right. You can't. But guess what? You know what you can do? You can reach one or two of them, and it will change you. John, you talked about authenticity a moment ago. This is what builds authenticity. I'm with my people. They know I love them, and I can prove it. And they say, you know what? That boy, that boy does love us. Mm -hmm. Three visits. It'll make a difference. All right. Okay. That's it. One more. No, number three. Come on, John. Don't turn me off yet. Number three. And, uh, and this is the same Matthew 10. And as you go, Jesus said, red letter words, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Mm-hmm. Hey, listen, guys, and girls, be the best preacher you can be. Preach passionately. Preach with everything you have. Pray, read widely, study deeply, and pray, p- preach passionately. Read widely, study deeply, and preach passionately. Our people are waiting to see if the message really has an effect on the communicator. If the Holy Spirit sets you ablaze, and if you're praying for the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to have to ask and beg for that fire. He'll put, He'll take care of it. Every morning you pray that prayer. If the Holy Spirit sets you ablaze, trust me, as John Wesley used to say, God sets me ablaze and people come around to watch me burn. <laughs> that's what preaching is. You know, that, that's because... You have made your life accessible to the Spirit. Ah, come on. Paul said, "For I've determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So that's it. Those are my three. Uh, pray, pray. Mingle with your people. Preach passionately. You young, you young guys, you're so lucky to be young. Don't ever take it. Don't, don't take your youth for, for, for granted. It will not be with you forever. But take advantage of what's with you now and be the young preacher and the young shepherd of the flock that God has called you to be. And there'll be an older guy up here at Andrews University who will be cheering you on. God bless you all. Thanks, Dwight. And you know, Dwight, you'll agree with me on this too. When you get to a certain age, your age, my age, you look back over your life and you say, you know what? My 30, my 40 years in the ministry, what did I do? Yeah. You're able to say you made mistakes. You're able to say you did some things right. But the thing you want to be able to say is, I didn't mail it in. You know, yeah. I, I was there. I was present. I gave my all. I was committed. You know, I, was, I wasn't I was some guy trying to slip by and fool people. You know, mm-hmm. I, was, 
I, I made a mistake, but at least I was there. And that's yeah. what you want to be able to say when your time is, I was there and I gave it my all while I was there. I was, I was honest, you know, I took the calling seriously. I yeah. committed myself to it. Yeah. I found work life balance, hopefully. So I didn't mm -hmm. lose my energy along the way. Mm -hmm. But I took my call seriously and I'm satisfied with the results. If I never got a big church, if I never baptized millions of people, I'm satisfied. Yeah. I know yeah. I gave my best. I did my best. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's the goal. What do you got, Paul? I, I'm, I'm going to take a minute here to get some folks to put their mm -hmm. comments up. Here's Tim. <clears throat> how much uh, How much or how often has church leadership asked for your insights into the reaching, changing the generational demographic of our church over the years during your ministry? You see his question there, Dwight? <laughs> um, you go, Tim. Come on, Tim. Don't, don't try to pick a fight with me now. He's asking because he knows. <laughs> no, it's a good point. I don't know. I don't know how many people from church administration have ever come to me and said, "Yo, Dwight, how about some insights?" I, I don't know that there was probably very many. Uh, uh, you know, I, I suppose it's a fair question to ask Dwight. How many times did you go to them and say, "Listen, brother, I got some insights for you about how to reach this generation." I, you know, I know I didn't do that either. So, uh, but I, th but I think your 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 tacit point is 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 a good one. We have to be asking, and we have to be asking each other. Mm -hmm. So you got a guy that's th three churches old, but seems to be doing quite well with Gen Zers. Come on, he may never come to you and say, "Hey, let me tell you what I do," but you can go to him and say, "Yo, what are you doing?" Mm -hmm. Man, how do you get this kind of a, you got a Pathfinder club like nothing I've seen. Where, where are all these kids coming from? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Well, I found out that when you do this with this and, you know, Taurus Montgomery, who's on, on our, our pastoral team, part, we, our pioneer camp is in the inner city of Benton Harbor. Taurus pastors there. And he has built this beautiful basketball court. It's an outdoor basketball court, but he is using basketball to reach that inner city and doing mm -hmm. a bang up job. We had 70 baptisms last summer wow. at Harbor and Oak. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, well, they weren't all from basketball, but uh, they're reaching the young. The deal is there may be somebody that's excelling near you. Go to that uh, bro and just say, yo, what's up? How do you do that, man? I'm, I'm all ears. Help me out. And it would just make this guy feel so good. Somebody's asking me how I do something. And uh, and you'll, you'll get blessed in the process. So it's a good, good suggestion to him. It's a good suggestion because it also suggests that we're partners, not competitors. Exactly. Share Come with on. We both get stronger along the way. That's yeah. that's that's how the work grows. What else you got, Paul? Uh, what do you do as a preacher when you hit uh, mental fatigue? Is Tina's question. Mental fatigue. Mm. That burnout thing. So many of us deal with. Yeah. You know. One of the things I do, guys, uh, a few years ago before. I was ice skating it down at the Notre Dame skating rink with my entire staff and I fell on the ice and I broke my hip and I cracked my shoulder. I got 16 pieces of metal up here and three down here on my hip <laughs> before that. In fact, that day I'd run, I had run six miles and then I fell on the ice pitiful. Uh, but running exercise is a key exercise. Mental fatigue can be relieved and stress can be relieved by physical exercise. Now I walk, I get up at six o'clock and I walk in the dark but I'll walk two miles. So, you know, it's going to be about 40 minutes of walking. I walked this morning. It's a little bit rain, but I had my cap on, so I was okay. Uh, I walk. Men mental fatigue can be refreshed by physical exercise. The Sunday block, the Sunday break is absolutely critical for you. you got to mm -hmm. stop thinking church. Don't talk church. Don't spend time on the phone church. Give you twenty. Give yourself twenty-four hours. Bill Hybels, who had his own story and you know, kind of a sad ending to it, but yeah. Bill Hybels used to say, "Man, you know, I've got, I've got a, a physical meter, a physical gauge, and a spiritual gauge." He said, "I was watching my spiritual gauge and my physical gauge, but I wasn't watching my emotional gauge." Mm -hmm. And so these three gauges, they're all tied together because we're holistic units. Uh, but you're just going to have to be at work. Sever from the uh, professional contacts. For me, getting together with some friends is a good is a way to relieve it. If you can find some friends within your clergy circles, because guys who people who do the same kind of work kind of know what you're talking about. They've been there and done that. Mm -hmm. and, and 
and uh, you don't lose anything by talking to people like that. So, so talk, uh, cut off uh, for 24 hours and exercise, get some exercise, uh, exercise for sure. Um, I just think there's something else, the mental, the mental fatigue, it will pass, you know, just like when you're tired and you sleep more, mm-hmm. your, your, your sleepiness passes. Mental fatigue can be, you just give yourself a break. You know, if you're writing week after week, after week, just get away from the parish. Just take, take a, take a, uh, take a Q day. And I, I know some guys would take a Q day once a week. That would mean, that would be me Sunday, but they take, they take a Q day once a month. They'll take a day where they just disappear from the parish. And then they take a Q week in the year where they're just totally cut off, not family, fun, 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 but just, just time to disengage. Mm-hmm. I've been blessed to uh, be able to do that in the month of July where I just stop, get other people to preach, line it up. And it's, of course I have the blessing of having a, a, a team of preachers, but, uh, uh, Tina, it's a good question. You can do it. Uh, work those breaks into your your busy life. Yeah, that's good counsel. That's good counsel. Um, you know what? I'm looking at my time, and we've we've exhausted it. It goes by so fast when you're talking to somebody. Our uh, time is going. I try to stick with that one hour. Uh, Dwight, you've been so great tonight. We really appreciate hearing from you. Uh, no, no more questions. <laughs> go, go ahead, well, that's, Paul. That's go, your son. That, that's me. Paul's using my, my thing to put some. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I've got a good, qu- couple of good questions. Go ahead, Paul. We'll go a little bit over. Put them up. You got them? Okay. As so many Adventists and Christians don't honestly believe in the equality of races, do you address that in your sermons? And how do you mm-hmm. begin to develop the mind of Jesus to not forget race, but celebrate and appreciate the differences? He's talking mm-hmm. about. It's a big part of your congregation, your life too. Yeah, that yeah. Diversity. yeah. it's a great question, Noelette. Um, thanks for asking it. Yeah, I preach on it. Um, some of you remember Andrews, is the, the university where I work, went through uh, kind of a crisis time when when uh, the chaplain at the time uh, was with a with a, a group of African American students. Uh, came up with hashtag it is time it is time Andrews and uh, it just kind of threw the, the whole institution into a into a tizzy and I was wondering what to do should I preach on this and, you know the president had it this I've never seen I've never seen a chapel so packed St- SRO standing room only I mean that's pioneer sanctuary in the balcony was just packed so this was a big deal. It was a crisis moment. And I, I, Andrea Luxton, the president, uh, got up and she addressed the matter. And uh, so, so that was a Thursday. I had already started working on my sermon that morning. Because remember, Thursday's my, my, day, my, my, my sermon right and day. But I, go, I try to go to chapels and, uh, from 1130 to 1230. So I'm in chapel and I'm, I'm seeing this, I'm feeling it. It was just, it was just palpable. And I'm, I'm sitting, I go back to my uh, study where I hole up downstairs here. And I, 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 I look at this sermon, I say, man, I can't preach this, but what should I do? Should I change? Should I not? Should I change? Should I not? And just like that, a young friend of mine, uh, attorney in uh, New York, wrote me a letter and said, hey, yo, pastor, I imagine you're sitting there thinking, what am I going to preach about this app? <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, mm-hmm. what this guy read my mind or what? <laughs> and he said, you know what? I'm praying that the Lord will give you the wisdom you need to deal with this. And it was all I needed. I just, that email just came and I saw it come across. You know how the email notifies you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I dropped it. I had a book on, uh, on, uh, on racism. It, it dealt with uh, white privilege, and I said, "I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach on white privilege," and I did. I did pre- preached his heart, uh, preached my heart out, and I, I said some uh, controversial. I made some controversial statements and stands, and and uh, I saw somebody get up and walk out of the church. Even so, I said, "Well, that must be a good sign, Lord. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's at work." Uh, but. I, I, I dealt with it that Sabbath. And actually, the previous Sabbath, I'd invited an interracial 
couple to come forward. And we had talked about uh, uh, their marriage. So I, I've not ducked the subject. I, every so often in the past, I used to preach on uh, why do we have regional conferences? <laughs> <laughs> So some of my, my African-American friends said, Dwight, you might as well drop that one. You're not going to get anything else but what we have. And then I read, in all candor, and Calvin Rock is a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I read his book, uh, Progress, Protest, and uh, what's the third one? P. Rock, yeah, I have Rock, book. Progress, yeah. Protest, but there's another one. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I read his book, and then I realized, and I, ta I, ta I talked to uh, uh, Elder Rock Later, I said, you know what? I read your book and then I got it. I got the point of why this is important. So I preached on it. I, I've had members transfer out of my church because I preached on it. Mm -hmm. uh, white uh, privilege. And uh, there's not a church very far from us where they can transfer to. And so, hey, you know, that's that's life. Uh, I got some letters. But, yeah, I, I'm not afraid to preach on it. And Tim Nixon could stand up and you give him the mic and he would tell you. You know, <laughs> my, my, my brother from another mother uh, preached has preached on this subject. I don't know that it all, I, I haven't solved the problems, no. but I've wanted to address them. I don't mm -hmm. want to just sit there and pretend like, well, everything's hunky-dory and Adventism. It's not. We are as racially fractured as the culture around us. And the mm -hmm. pandemic has exposed that fracture in ways we never saw before. Mm -hmm. And it's sad. And we have unfinished business. And you and I are part of a healing process. I don't know the answers, but we can be praying and we can be preaching toward the answers. Right. Because preaching won't heal it. Preaching won't heal it. It'll be, it'll be the Holy Spirit coming down, doing a Pentecost thing, number on us. And mm -hmm. suddenly hearts that were separated are, are just bound together. Even under the Holy Spirit, the church has struggled. You know, you look at the Acts 6. I mean, that was, a, that was clearly an ethnic struggle between Hellenists and Hebrew widows and, and the church did not know what to do until they said, well, we got to get Hellenist uh, deacons then mm -hmm. to represent this, this major group. So it's a good question, Noelette. Uh, yeah, I do. I, I haven't solved anything. That's up to the Holy Spirit. I don't know, but I don't think we should duck. We should duck anything. Duck it. No, it won't go away. Last one. Dwight is a great inductive preacher. Explain to some important lips about effective inductive preaching. Can you do that in just a couple of minutes? Yeah, in two minutes. Um, the, 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 difference between, the difference between deductive preaching and inductive preaching, I did my little dissertation on this for my doctor of ministry. The difference is that deductive preaching states the big idea at the beginning, God is love, and here are three reasons to prove God is love. All right, here are three reasons. Right. Uh, inductive preaching says here are three experiences, life experiences that we all know. And as this, as the experiences begin to hone down, leading the listener to say, aha, God must be love. So mm -hmm. inductive, deductive, deductive states the truth to prove it. Inductive allows the listener to be drawn in to discover it. Jesus mm -hmm. dominantly taught by inductive methods, mm -hmm. a method because parables are in, totally inductive. You have no idea what, what what's this sower going out and throwing seed have to do with anything mm -hmm. until you get to the very end. You have no idea about the lost boy until you get to the very end. Mm -hmm. You have no idea about the about the uh, the uh, what's another good one. You know, well, all of all three of the Luke fifteen. The point is, parables take us. They hold us off, hold us off, hold us off until until we get. Until we get it, yeah. the point. And and that, the, that's what you own the thought more because you you develop that thought as you listen. Now it's your exactly. thought. Somebody that's else. It. Told you. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, because you you buy into it because you follow the same logic. And look at guys when we write our sermons. How, how do we write our sermons? We write our sermons inductively because we've been taking notes all day and all week and slowly. Oh, this is the big idea. We have we need to let our people do the same. Just go through it slowly. The story. How can God be loved with this this beautiful twenty three year old just graduated from Andrews? It's killed in a head on car accident as she's driving to the airport to fly to Kettering to interview for a job. How can God be loved now? Mm -hmm. So we interject the stories. The stories keep us real. But yeah. then this happens. Then this. So uh, that yeah. is just a two-minute uh, summary. Uh, I, I would suggest 
that the younger the listener, the more inductive the preference. Okay. So if you got a lot of teens in your in your church, there's no question. Given an old God is loving here, if 18 key verses, that's not going to hold their attention. They're gone in uh, 60 seconds. Why? Because they need something to grab them and to just keep holding them, keep drawing them in. So inductive is going to be the best way to reach uh, 40 and under, probably 50 and under, maybe 80 and under, oh, 80 and over. If you have a church 80 and over, try the deductive <laughs> method. But, uh, <laughs> probably inductive would be the most, yeah, it'll hold on to the, hold on to the uh, listener. Narrative, story, uh, parable, story, narrative That's preaching it. is yeah. inductive. You draw yeah. people in, you take them on a journey. At the end of the journey, they understand, and then yeah. you they grasp it. That's yeah. great. I wish we, we could spend more time with you, Dwight. And uh, yes, you. Uh, you see the comments coming in, but I'm going to let you go and let our people go. Um, thanking you for being with us tonight. Just with the reminder to everybody, if you're in our Tuesday night class, this coming Tuesday, you should have received a link from me by now, a Zoom link. You should have gotten it by now. If you, if I, um, if I induct you uh, into the class and you have not gotten that Zoom link, email me tonight. I'll make sure I get it to you. But this Tuesday, 7.30 Central Time, we have our class on Hebrews being taught by Dr. Greg Allen. And 7.30 Central Time, you got the Zoom link. We'll come together. We'll meet Dr. Allen. He'll take us through that study. Um, Next week, we continue our Jesus in the law sermon. We did part one, part two next week. Jesus Christ in the law of God. We're going to do that. Uh, Rodney Grissom, different ones coming on. Uh, Dwight saying thank you to you for sharing and how enlightening it was. We want to thank you, too, and appreciate you very much. <laughs> Tina wants part two. Well, I don't know. We'll see. Bring him back. We'll see. He's. A, I, I had a hard time getting him. He's a busy guy, but he gave us this time tonight. Now, I really appreciate it, Dwight. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, my privilege. Let's give him an applause, everybody. <laughs> That's too good. <laughs> Love to the family. Have a good time. I will. I See will. You. Say it to you. Friday night, we'll continue our sermon on Jesus and the law. Until next Friday. God bless. God be with you.